Bible Center. Um, Pastor David Meeks, it's Bible study time. So uh, we're in the sanctuary. Not sure who all is coming today. I think some have gotten used to doing it live. And and uh, Miss Maddie's here with us. And uh, But I'm not sure if anybody else is coming or not. And I apologize for being late, but uh, sometimes that happens. We're having little times of rushing. Um, so we'll wait on you guys to pop in here and see who we have. And uh, Pamela Clausen, there you are. And uh, good to have you, Pam, and uh, Billy Meeks. And I'm going to go get a bottle of water while you guys can talk to each other. So I'll be right back. And let us know if you can hear us all right. <laughs> Okay, hello Billy, good to have you, sound is good, okay, because we do have the air conditioning on, and uh, Miss Maddie's across from me, she didn't want to be a Facebook movie star today, so we're going to respect that, <laughs> um, but I'm glad you guys are here, we'll wait on a couple of other people, and then we're going to get started uh, in the scriptures here, and um, if the air is too loud, please let me know. But it's good to have you guys. We had a good prayer meeting last night. And um, now um, uh, we're going to do our Bible study. I thought we'd have some folks show up, but I guess they got maybe delayed. It's all right. But uh, we'll see if anybody else wants to pop online here. And we're going to get started. So I hope everyone's having a good day. And so far we got Pam and Billy. And I know there's a few others on there, so let us know who you are. I'm just trying to see the little icons up there. Can't make them out. Um, okay. But we're dropping numbers now. Okay. <laughs> this is odd. Well, we're going to get started. Billy, I'm glad you joined us. Pam, and I know Caden is with her. So we got at least three of you here, and Miss Maddie is me and uh, and you. So we're going to... Start, Father, we pray in Jesus' name for your presence to be here today as we study your word together. For all those that will come online, Lord, and those that uh, uh, will be here, Lord. I'm sure some are going to show up. So, Father, we pray right now for your word of wisdom and your spirit to overshadow us, God. Your presence to be upon us, Lord. We thank you for your goodness and your grace. We ask that your word would be alive in Jesus' name. We all said amen. amen. We are in the book of 2 Corinthians, uh, chapter 2, and uh, we're just going to read through. We, we're, literally, we've been going through Corinthians, uh, and I've shared over and over online how that in 1 Corinthians, this is just amazing to me, is that uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, the Apostle Paul is saying to them, you know, I would like to give you meat, but I can't because you're carnal. Um, and he says, are not you carnal when there is among you envy, strife, and division? And, and every time we've studied, I keep bringing this back up because envy, strife, and division blurs the word of God. It causes us to have a distorted viewpoint of the scriptures, a distorted viewpoint of direction, it causes us not to be able to hear the way we ought to hear God's word. It kind of puts us in a real jam. And uh, the, to me, the whole book of 1 Corinthians was written to a church that couldn't tell what the direction was. A church that couldn't tell what its sin is. A church that, hello Amy, good to have you. Uh, a church that couldn't tell. So where there's envy, strife, and division... There's the inability to clearly hear the Lord. And uh, I'm just going to say this is a personal thing, that we all have uh, these times where we're close to God and sometimes we're not as close to God, and, and you all understand that. And I've had to make decisions 
as a pastor, someone would come up to me and say, hey, Pastor David, uh, can we do this or what about this? And there's been a few times in my life where I had to say, not right now, I'll give you a decision later because I had to go clear my mind and my heart before the Lord. It's so dangerous to make life decisions when you're not close to God. I want to say that again. It's so dangerous to make life decisions when you're not connected. When there's envy, strife, or division, don't make any decisions at all if that's reigning in your life because you're not hearing clear, you're not seeing clear, and you won't act straight. You'll, you'll make some mistakes. We must have a clean heart and a pure, clean hands and a pure heart before God, uh, and that, that comes in the realm of forgiveness and lifting others up above ourselves so that we can have a clear ear of the Lord. As a pastor, I've been, uh, you know, doing this, Lord, I've been in church all my life, but 33 years of pastoring now, and I've had hundreds of people come up to me and say, God told me this and God told me that. And you have to question, did he really? Or what voice are we hearing? Because if we've got envy, strife, and division in us, sometimes that voice of God is not as clear as it ought to be. Just, just a free note. So the church in Corinth was given instructions by the apostle Paul because he was not doing right. They, they were not doing right. And Paul had to kind of almost redirect their path. You'd think a spirit-filled church could hear God. But... Um, Apparently they couldn't. So he gives them the instructions in 1 Corinthians. And this is the second letter that he wrote to them. Kind of a follow-up letter on the first one. And we are in uh, uh, chapter 2. And Maddie, do you mind reading a little too uh, today? No, just make it the same thing. Yeah, we can. Instead of me just reading to you, Miss Maddie is here. And uh, so... um, uh, we're going to let her read a little bit, too, and, and we'll just kind of break it apart. So um, we're starting on chapter 2. And, Matt, if you don't mind, just read down and uh, just see what you come up with. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move this camera okay. over a little bit, if you don't mind. Go you ahead. Just stop me when you want me to stop. Uh-huh. Go for it. For I made up my mind not to make another painful visit to you. For if I cause you pain, who is there to make me glad but the one to whom I have pained? And I wrote as I did, so that when I came, I might not suffer pain from those who should have made me rejoice. For I felt sure of all of you, that my joy would be the joy of you all. For I wrote to you out of much affliction and anguish of heart, and with many tears, not to cause you pain, but to let you know the abundant love that I have for you. Now if anyone has caused pain, he has caused it not to me, but in some measure, not to put it too severely, to all of you. For such a one, this punishment by the majority is enough, so that so you should rather turn to forgive and comfort him, or he may be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. So I beg you to reaffirm your love for him. But this is why I wrote, that I might test you and know whether you are obedient in everything. Anyone whom you forgive, I also forgive. Indeed, what I have forgiven, if I have forgiven anything, has been for your sake in the presence of Christ so that we would not be outwitted by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his designs. Okay, that's good. Now let me just say this. If you remember in the last letter he wrote, there was a young man that was having an affair with his stepmother, and the church condoned it. The church allowed it. And I'm going to say this. Hello, Tina Marie and Joyce. Good to have you guys with us. Lacey Mapp, good to have you as well. Uh, boy, Lacey, I'd sure like to see you again sometime. It's awesome to have you join us. But the early church in Corinth had allowed a uh, adulterous affair between a son and a stepmother, and they they were so filled with arrogance and pride that came from the bottom line of envy, strife, and division so strong that it blurred their vision that they couldn't see the, the grievousness of this sin. Paul actually said, said the ungodly don't even allow this kind of a thing to go on, and the church is allowing it. He said, what's wrong with you people? And so he makes a statement. He says, kick him out of the church. If you don't repent, kick him out and let Satan have his way with him. 
so that he might get his heart right with God. Well, guess what? Chapter or Second Corinthians chapter two, Paul is addressing that thing and saying, "Look, it might be time to forgive him. It might be time to bring him back. It might be time to uh, allow him to uh, get his heart right." And so Paul wasn't being some hard nosed saying, "You know, I don't care." You know, you can read it that way, but he said, with much sorrow and torment of heart and brokenness. You know, sometimes people think that a leader enjoys correcting or even disciplining. You know, if a leader enjoys that, they're really not a leader. They're heartbroken every time. Every time someone goes amiss or messes up or, or has to be corrected, it's, it's a, a heartbreaking thing in the the heart of that leader. And you, if, if you're a leader at all, you know what I'm talking about. Most everybody is a leader of some sort. Even if, if you don't run a business or a church, but you have children, and you've had to discipline your children, sometimes harshly. I'd say raise your hand if you've had to do that, but I can't see your hand. But here's the fact. There are times that we've had to discipline our children harshly, and a good parent... It doesn't feel good to them, but they're doing it because they love that child. And so Paul is saying, look, this with much brokenness of heart and in my spirit, I, I had to do this. But he says, but it may be time to forgive and uh, to, to bring that person back where he belongs. And somewhere in here we'll read it, but it speaks about godly sorrow brings us to repentance, which is a good thing. Um, but we'll, we'll address it. So I want to go back. I just want to not mess up here. Um, verse 10 says, To whom you forgive anything, I also forgive. For if I forgive anything to whom I forgive, for your sake, forgive I it for the person of Christ, lest Satan should get advantage of us. So he's saying, stay close to the Lord. Where are we at, uh, uh, Maddie? Which verse, verse 12? 12. Uh, Fayre, are you with us? Yes. Chapter 2, verse, start with verse 12. Favor is going to read, if you guys don't mind. Good to have you, Christine. Chapter 2, 12. Verse, starting verse 12 and keep reading. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Furthermore, when I came to Tro Troas to preach Christ's gospel, and a door was opened to me by the Lord, I had no rest in my spirit. Because I did not find this, find Titus, my brother. But taking my leave of them, I departed for Macedonia. Now thanks be to God, who always leads us in triumph in Christ, and through us diff uh, diff <laughs> diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. For we are to God... The fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are per perishing. To the one we are the aroma of death leading to death and to the other the aroma of life leading to life. And who is sufficient for these things? For we are not as so many peddling the word of God but as of sincerity but as from God, we speak in the sight of God in Christ. Okay, so 15 says, there we go, we're back. I hope this is working this way. It's kind of a different way to do it. 15 says, for we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ in them that are saved and in them that perish. To one we are a savor to death, unto death, and to the other a savor of life. And who is sufficient? For these things this is some crazy stuff but bottom line it comes down to this there's always going to be those that say uh you know you brought good to me because of your christian stance and there's always going to be those that say no it's a bad thing we live in a world of of split minds you know half this world right now thinks that you if you're a christian are a hater of all mankind because you're pointing out sin, because you're trying to walk up a, a way that is pleasing to God. Uh, so half the world says you guys are haters. 
and to them that is darkness. And then on the other side, those that open their heart up and receive Christ are saying, your words brought life to me. It's amazing to me. And they don't realize every one of us were like them. You know, everyone has sinned and come short of the glory of God. And this gospel message has transformed our lives. And to God, it's a sweet savor. It's a smell. We're in a real war, a tug of war with this world and all of its ins and outs. It's just the way it is. So uh, uh, half the world's going to accept the Jesus in you. And a lot won't accept the Jesus in you. What did the Apostle Paul or Jesus say to the apostles? He said, if you go into a city and, and they reject it, just dust the dirt from your shoes and move on. And uh, unfortunately, that's the way it works. We, we're going to have some people that will look at you like you're crazy. You already know that. But you've got to share the gospel of Christ with them. You've got to live the testimony. I was speaking with someone uh, the other day, and they ran into a friend of mine that I had 30-some uh, years ago. And they had mentioned my name to him and had a conversation about it. And, and the story is quite interesting. Uh, this person, I'm not going to go into too many details, but this person was pretty close to me and, and my wife, and uh, he married my wife's best friend. And it was a beautiful thing, you know, and we hung out all the time. We would get together for Christmases, and you get trees together, and our kids would play together and all that. And there was a day when we began to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with them. And there was an interest, and there was a more of an interest from his wife than from him. But we just continued to talk to them about the Lord. And again, they were like best friends. And the next thing you know, Tammy and I decided to buy a Bible and bring it to them and, and give it to her best friend. And so we brought the Bible in, and we gave it to the, the woman and said, Hey, just wanted you to have a Bible. And she was so happy. Do you know that was the last time we ever saw them people? <laughs> Never saw them again. We had a dinner engagement. And we said they canceled. Then we had Christmas and they canceled. We had the next Christmas they canceled. They just literally cut us off like nothing I've ever seen before. Why? Because they were starting to hear the gospel and they didn't want it. And so what's going to happen is some people are going to take your words as negative. They're going to take your your testimony is something bad and they're going to see it as death to them and not life but then there are those other ones that you open your heart up and they say I want what you have you buy them a bible and their tears in their eyes saying thank you so much that's that's what we do we minister to them we minister to whomever God allows us to we share the gospel because we don't know which ones may serve the Lord and which ones won't but we carry the word of God and we don't slow it down. And that is a sweet-smelling savor to God. The Bible says heaven rejoices when a sinner is saved. So it's very powerful. Are you with me? So we start out chapter 1. He's speaking about uh, uh, soul saving and witnessing. He's speaking about uh, his distress over some of the, the things that had to go on and um, uh, references to to 1 Corinthians saying, look, you know, th this was hard for me. It was really hard for me to write a letter of correction. And uh, uh, we carry the gospel on. So I hope you receive something out of that. Hallelujah. Thank you, Chris. Christina says, but the seed needs to be planted. Did you hear me? And that's a wonderful point, Chris. I appreciate you bringing that up. Because even though they reject it, the seed needs to be planted. And, and you know, I, I appreciate you bringing that up because I'm going to say this. I, I actually thought about this the other day. I said, you know, even though they might have rejected what we, we gave them the Bible and all of that, who knows that their memory one day might go all the way back to that point. And that seed might begin to come back to life again. So I thank you for bringing that point. We're in the Bible study together, so you guys don't hesitate to make comments. And we've seen a lot of people get saved because 
they had a seed planted in their life. You are a seed planter, guys. And uh, if they reject it, just walk away from it, but know that you planted a seed and God is the one that pours the increase. He's the one that pours the water on it. And uh, he'll use whatever circumstances, even the coronavirus, to get people to say, hey, God. You know, when my mother, um, she didn't have anything of religion in her life except for, you know, a little bit. I think she knew the Our Fathers. That was all that was in her heart. And when she got in a jam with the enemy and she ran to pray, that's what she went back to was the seed that was planted in her life of the Our Fathers. That's all she knew. That was the beginning of God coming in and getting ready to set her free from the bondage that was taking her life. So don't underestimate that seed. Thank you, Chris. I appreciate that, keeping us straight on this thing. We're going to start with chapter 3. Uh, Maddie, if you don't mind, read 1 to 5. And, and, uh, and if I'm itching a little bit, probably because I have a flea that bit me. But we're all right. Go ahead, Maddie. Are we beginning to commend ourselves again, or do we need, as some do, letters of recommendation to you or from you? You yourselves are our letter of recommendation, written on our hearts, to be known and read by all. And you show that you are a letter from Christ, delivered by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not on tables of stone, but on tables of human hearts. Such is the confidence that we have through Christ toward God. Not that we are sufficient in ourselves to claim anything as coming from us, but our sufficiency is from God, who has made us sufficient to be ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Keep going. I'm good. Go ahead. Yeah. Now, if the ministry of death, carved in letters on stone, came with such glory that the Israelites could not gaze at Moses' face because of its glory, which was being brought to you an end, Will not the ministry of the Spirit have even more glory? For if there was glory in the ministry of condemnation, the ministry of righteousness must far exceed it in glory. Indeed, in this case, what once had glory had come to have no glory at all because of the glory that surpasses it. For if what was being brought to an end came with glory, much more will what is permanent have glory. Okay. So here we go. Then this is kind of, kind of a tongue twister here. Yeah. But he, what, basically what he's saying is the law of Moses and the Ten Commandments brought a glory. And we're going to read about that, I believe, uh, the veil on his face. But that glory was a fading glory. He said, but when it comes to the, the presence of God and the law of the Holy Spirit and the working of God in our lives, he said that glory never fades. That presence never fades. And he says, you are an epistle written in our hearts, known and read of all men. Okay. In other words, you, you, church, and I, we are a love letter that God has written on planet Earth. We're a living epistle. We are the letter of God. He, he has touched us. His, 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 his spirit is in us. His laws he's put on our heart. And we serve God uh, not so much because we're afraid of going to hell. I mean, I don't know anybody that serves God because they're afraid to go to hell. That, that may be a, an awareness, a truth that there's a heaven and a hell, but most everybody I know serves God because they just love him, because he loves us back. And so uh, we become the Bible that people read. Do you realize that? You are the Bible that people read. And let me ask you this, and I know this is going to sting a little bit, uh, maybe not for the ones on here, but maybe for others in the future that might see this. If we're the Bible that people read, then ask yourself this question, what are they reading? Will my life lead them to Christ, or will my life discourage them from Christ? Will my words lead them to Christ, or will my words discourage them? Will my attitude lead them to Christ, or will my attitude discourage them? If I'm a living epistle, if I'm the living word of God, alive inside of me, that the world can read it. Let me read it again. You are, verse 2, our epistle written in our hearts, known and read of all men. Wow. Um, this is very powerful. And so, as we live our life, 
Others are reading our life. I pray that your life and my life will lead them to Jesus Christ. One of the scriptures, Paul said, you want to know how to be a Christian? Just do what I do. That's quite a statement. If someone hung around us and did what we did and said what we said, would that lead them to Christ? I'm not trying to condemn anybody. We all got some work to be done. That's for sure. Um, and uh, let's go on. It says, and the ministration or the Old Testament glory faded. And I, I want to go, let's a favor, read verse 12 to 17 if you would. Therefore, since we have such hope, we use great boldness of speech. Unlike Moses, who put a veil over his face so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the end of what was passing away, but their minds were blinded. For until this day, the same veil remains un unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament, because the veil is taken away in Christ. But even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil lies on their heart. Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Again? 17. Now the Lord is the spirit and where the spirit of the lord is there is liberty okay so here we go he's saying he's saying that moses had a veil over his face and and it's a twofold veil because when he came out of the mountain you gotta understand he was on a, on a fast three different times he fasted two of those times he didn't eat nor drink and he saw the hinder part of God. He saw the glory of the Lord. He was in the presence of God. And when he came down from the mountain, the presence of God, literally his face, it said it would shoot out like horns. Like they could see this, this darting brightness. They couldn't even look upon his face, so they covered his face. But the Apostle Paul said, that great glory, he covered his face, in, in realizing that that glory was a fading glory. You ever had one of those glow sticks? Uh, I have, when I was a kid, the glow in the dark, my daughters, I think, had the, the little stars you stick on the ceiling, you know what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. And, and when, when the light hits them right, they glow in the dark. And so if you have a glow in the dark item, as long as it's got enough sun, it'll glow for quite a while. But Leave it in the dark too long, and guess what? It'll fade out. You can't even tell they're there. And what he was saying is the glory that Moses was presenting was a fading glory. And so when they covered his face, they were literally covering the glory that was going to fade off anyway. But the glory was there because he was in the presence of God. Think about this. You and I, it says, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And uh, you and I have been able to not be in the glory of God that Moses was in. For you and I have been in a greater glory. We are a product of the day of Pentecost glory. Where he didn't say, I'm going to show you my glory. He said, I'm going to put my glory inside of you and the world will see my glory through you. And that glory doesn't fade. In Acts chapter 1, I just want to read this to you real quick. Um, Acts chapter 1, uh, verse 8. It says this. But you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit comes upon you. You shall be a witness in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. The word power there in the Greek is dunamis. And it means inherent power capable of reproducing itself like a generator. Do you understand what's inside of us? Moses didn't have that. He went and he's like a glow stick. He got in the glory and when he came down, the, the glow began to die off. And that's all they had. But you and I have something so much better because we get to get in his presence and his presence gets inside of us. And therefore the whole world can read the Jesus that's alive inside of you and me and it doesn't fade off. 
It doesn't mean that we don't have some dry up days and some cold days. We do that in our flesh, but it doesn't change who he is on the inside. How many in this group and on this table can say in your weakest moment, often God has used you the greatest? Am I right? I mean, that's, it's like when we're, when we're at, the, at the, the moment of, man, I'm, I'm, there's nothing left in me. And God says, but I'm still in you. So this glory never fades. The world is seeing it. Whether it's a child, we said this before, there's no junior Holy Spirit. And there's no senior Holy Spirit. It can be a simple word from someone that is a child or someone that is a senior and saying, this is what God says. It carries power. This glory doesn't fade. How awesome is that? Oh, I'm going to mess with somebody's head for a moment. But I'm going to say this. I know people that have anointings in certain areas. And uh, uh, I'm going to say this. I'm just going to pick on my brother for a minute, Sam. Most of you, some of you know him, some of you don't. And Sam has a, he, he used to be a worship leader for years. That's what he did. And he would preach the gospel, powerful man of God. I think it was before his time in, in literally worship leading. You know, some of the stuff they're doing now, he did 20 years ago. But he hadn't been in the church and he hadn't played you know, in our church for a long time, many, many years. And I know he worshiped the Lord in his, in his time, but he's not a worship leader right now. And, but he loves God and he plays his keyboard and worships him. When my mother got sick, he came in the church and the whole family came in here to pray. And we asked him to step behind the keyboard. Let me tell you something. The second his hands touched the keys, the anointing of God fell in the building. Did you hear me? The very second, because God's callings are without repentance, because inside of him, even though the opportunity or whatever he's doing is may shift it a little bit in his life, it doesn't take away the glory of the Lord that abides inside of him. So, and that is his gift from God. As a young man, uh, a prophet has said, you're going you're gonna to play the instruments and you're going to lead worship. And he immediately was able to start playing. It was crazy. He played the he could play the keyboard, and he'd lead worship. The moment his hands would hit those keys, you can feel the presence of God saturate. And you know, I've had plenty of piano players over the years, and different ones that have played instruments. And, and I can tell you, I tell you, there's a difference. You can have one person play the piano, and it's just something they learned. But you can have someone that's played the piano. It's something they've been called to do. Does that make sense to you guys? And, and even my, my grandson, Caden, he's, he's learning the keyboard. He's playing for the youth and things. And sometimes at night, 11 o'clock at night, he'll be out there playing the keyboard. And I told Sister Tammy, I said, it reminds me of my brother because my brother would go late at night. And I think 1999 or 2000 is when our church got burned down. And he had just left here. He was playing late at night, just worshiping the Lord. Very powerful. And uh, someone came in after that and burned the place down. But God restored it. God is always faithful. So the building was anointed when they caught the fire. <laughs> we, that'd be a whole other message. But Caden will go in there and he'll start playing that keyboard. And it reminds me of my brother because it's 11 o'clock at night and everybody's trying to sleep. And this, this young man's in the living room playing the keys. But he's not playing the piano. He's playing in the anointing in the glory and that that's the same thing my brother would do every time he touch those keys the anointing and even now even now at this moment uh, just a year or so ago he was playing those keys and you could just feel the glory of the lord listen to me church he didn't come to fade off inside of us he's always able to be activated like that do you understand what i'm saying a preacher can preach and the anointing is there like that. The gifts of God are without repentance. It's a very powerful thing. Your life is a written and living epistle to an entire generation and world. Someone might say, well, my life is wore out. Your life isn't wore out till you take your last breath and say, I'm coming home, Jesus. You may be a little tired. We all may be a little tired. But the Holy Ghost inside of you is not tired. The Holy Spirit does not get wore out. The Holy Spirit does not say, hey, I just feel too tired to do this. He says, all I need you to do is trust me. 
And I'm going to remind you, Moses stepped into the ministry not when he was 40, but when he was 80. So just letting you know, Caleb went and got his mountain not when he was 40, but when he was 80. Did you hear me? Abraham had the promised child when he was 100. <laughs> I'm wore out. No, God is not wore out. <laughs> I'm tired, I'm getting old, or I'm too young, or I'm too... Thin. No, the Holy Spirit, the glory that is in you is a living, written anointing of God to let the world read Jesus out of your life. Wow. Now, I'm going to take a sideline. You can't operate outside your anointing. It doesn't work like that. You may play a keyboard, but if the anointing is not there for that, it's just good music. You can always tell the difference. It moves people. Oh, it's powerful. doesn't mean if you don't play under the anointing, you're not any good. Thank God for, for those that musicians, we need them all. But some, that is their primary purpose and call. I'll give you a testimony. My brother... He'd hate this. I'm glad he's not on. Because Mike Murdoch, if you've ever heard of Mike Murdoch, Mike Murdoch is a minister that raises money. He's, he's, uh, they call him in to raise money. He's, he's a very blessed guy. And he'd sit behind the keyboard and just play and prophesy. And uh, very powerful stuff. And his, his, his message is solid. Well, anyway, some years ago, the Lord spoke to me and said, that's the place your brother's anointing is the greatest, is behind the keyboard. And I'll never forget we to rebuild the first building, the one that burned down. Yeah. And we needed um, $5,000 to uh, get the slab finished, I think it was. Because we had, we, our first building is we took down a building in Pearl River, Louisiana. We didn't know what we were doing. We've, it was, a, it was a, a Western Auto. And we videotaped ourselves taking the building down so we could figure out how to put it back up. <laughs> And so we tore the whole building down, brought it, and put it in storage. And then we decided, let's try to put our building up. And so we got ready, and we needed, we needed about $5,000 to finish the slab. And uh, my brother is playing the keyboard, the, or the piano, and he starts prophesying. And he says, I'm going to tell you right now, somebody out there is going to write a check for $5,000, and we're going to get that slab done. Now, that came off of the playing because that's where the anointing is. Do you understand what I'm saying? When you step into your place, I don't know why I got into this, I guess because of the living epistle, but when we find the place that we're anointed and we function it, it might be making phone calls. It might be praying. It might be singing. It might be giving. It might be baking. Anyway, whatever it is, operate in your anointing because that's where God will flow. And then he'll add to it. So my brother that Sunday, I think it was a Sunday morning, he was playing the piano, and he began to say, somebody out there is going to give a $5,000 check. And I'm saying, well, praise God, that will fix the slab. There was a lady in our church that missed that Sunday. And I think it was within a week or two she calls me up randomly. We didn't have Internet. We didn't have Facebook. We didn't have none of this where she could see what was said. She was a military lady. She, she uh, worked hard and she would come to church. She wasn't like one that was connected to everybody and always talking. She was, she was uh, uh, a hardworking lady. And she called me up and she said, uh, Pastor David, um, I'm, I'm going to be uh, moving, but I want to bless the church. What's it going to take to put that building up? And I said, well, from our calculations, around $5,000. She said, I'm bringing you a check tomorrow out of my retirement for $5,000 before I move out of state. And I said, my brother prophesied this. She said, well, I'm bringing you a check. Now, this is uh, the year, I don't know what year, 12 years before 2000, so it would be 1980-something, maybe early 1990s. $5,000 was a whole load of money. And she, she brought that check in, and I was just blown away. My point to you is this. When, when we're in our anointing, our calling, and we need to say, God, show me what is it that I excel in? What, what is my, my place? 
when we're in that place, that's where God begins to multiply what we do. And for my brother, the anointing was on the keys in his worship. He spent thousands of hours in the middle of the night playing and worshiping God. But what God did was add to that prophecy. Does that make sense to you guys? Yes. So wherever your anointing is, and you say, God, what is it? Well, I, I do hospitality. Okay, that's one of his gifts. Um, I, I'm just make, I'm a phone call person. So that's one of his gifts. Uh, I mean, here's, if, you're, if you're in the anointing to call people, I'm not talking about gossiping. I'm talking about calling to check on people. When you call them, if that's your place, and your comfort zone, and you just feel good about it, and you call them, the Spirit of God will begin to open up word of knowledge to you as you can speak into people's lives. And that will satisfy you beyond what you can ever be satisfied. Do you understand what I'm saying, churches? We all have a calling in our life. And when we, when we operate in that particular anointing, become that living word for them to see. God will multiply it. Did you hear me? You know, um, please, uh, I love all my grandchildren a lot. I love all my children a lot. But I also love my spiritual family a lot. So when it comes down to the things of God, I, I lump everybody together. You know, everyone is to, is, I have to separate, not, not say families this. They're, even though I call them grandkids or daughters or son-in-laws they're still all lumped together with the entire body so yesterday morning uh i had to go to a funeral and, and sister tammy and i felt like the spirit of god said ask isabella to do the daily daily uh word and so i said well i kind of blew it off because i didn't give her much time and i said well i don't know what i'm gonna do so it's about 10 30 and she says what are you gonna do about the daily word and i said i don't know she said, why don't you ask Isabella? And I said, well, that's all I needed. That was my confirmation from the Lord. So I called Isabella up and said, would you come and do the daily word? I don't know if you watched it. If you didn't, you should. Everybody, I think, on the other end of the, the camera was crying at one point. And I told Isabella, I said, Isabella, do you realize the anointing you have for communication? I mean, did, did either one of you get to listen to it? Did you? That was anointed, wasn't it? It was like as simple and plain as she was. It just like it captivated you and drew you right into it. And the anointing is on specific areas of our life. And I told her, I said, that's a place. You're a communicator. There's no question about it. And some people want to be communicators. And they, they, they do, okay, let me pick on Marcus. He's not watching, so I'll pick on him for a minute. <laughs> Pastor Marcus, is, yeah, I love him. He's a great minister. He's not the best drummer in the world. Facts. Marcus had to learn the drums the hard way. He had to go get lessons and work hard to play those drums. Now, it's fairly natural because he's conditioned himself to be a drummer, and he does good with it. But, it's on him. The second he stepped behind the drums, when he was a child, he was playing the drums. You knew this kid's going to drum. It's in him. It's a part of him. And so Marcus may be a drummer, but he's anointed to preach and communicate. Eli may be a drummer, but he's anointed to drum. And when he touches those drums and he's pushing into the Lord, do you understand he can do a prophetic sound out of those drums. It just depends what is the we can do multiple things, but there's keyed in areas of God that He wants to use us that are so powerful. As a pastor, I've had to do a little bit of everything. I mean, I'm a pastor, a plumber, electrician, carpenter, painter, um, counselor, marriage counselor, and children's counselor, and everything in between. I gotta prophesy, I gotta do all this, gotta do all that. All of those are not the place that I'm anointed the most. But the areas where I'm anointed, God can use them effectively and powerful. Are you understanding me? You have some gifts. You're a living epistle to the world. Don't give up on that calling. 
And if you don't know what it is, just seek the Lord and say, God, here I am, use me. And all you got to do is just look at your life and say, what is the thing that I love to do and that produces the most out of it? Because I'm going to tell you something. If I decided today I love to bake, it's not going to produce much good. Ask my kids. I tried to cook when, I, when they were babies. They said, we're not eating that, Dad. It's funny because it's true. Tammy was gone to work. And, and I can cook, though. I mean, I can do it. I, I know how to open a can of something and put it in the microwave. But I'm not anointed in that, I promise you. I'm out of my element. But I can still do it. So I can't claim to have something good just because I do it. Is that making sense to you? I hope it is. So the kid, Tammy's at work one day or something, and I'm at home, and I told her I'd make, the, I'd make their dinner or lunch or whatever it was. I can't hardly remember. But do you guys remember when they had that cabbage soup diet? Years ago, it was just a bunch of cabbage soup. Well, Tammy told me to make hamburger helper. It was like stroganoff or something, the hamburger helper. And I said, sure. So I decided... Tammy mixes stuff together. Some will mix the cabbage soup with the stroganoff hamburger helper. Now, some of you are gagging already. So I, I poured it into this cabbage soup, and I made cabbage soup hamburger helper beef stroganoff thing. And, man, Tina looked at it. Thank God she's protecting Mandy because she was the older one. She says, I hope you don't think we're eating that stuff. And it was like, it was bad. And, I mean, it was horrible bad. Well, I'm going to say this. There's some people try to think they're anointed in an area, and it doesn't produce anything. I know that stings a little bit. So we need to say, God, show me the area that I'm called in, and that I can be the most effective, that I can affect the lives of people. This isn't to beat anybody down. I hope this is to beating anybody down. No, we're good. It means that, that we have callings in our life. And don't try to step out of that calling. Just say, God, use me where I'm called to be used. You know? Um, favor, I'm going to pick on you for a minute. There's Favor. Everybody wave at Favor. There she is. Um, you know, there's a lot of different things you do in the kingdom. But one thing that you excel at is being a caregiver. Serving and loving people that are sick. You've done that. You know, with your aunt, I saw you do that. You, you tend to... My mother, you, where you work at, there, there's an anointing in that that you can speak life into them. That, that's, that's a major call in your life. It's a part of you. It's just kind of a part of your makeup. So, and, and there's other areas that you do, whether it's teaching, you know, what have you. But, and those are all good things. But I'm just saying to, to say, you know, what do I do? It, it's amazing because you can watch people. Um, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not a big Whoopi Goldberg. Is that how you say name uh fan but I, I remember the one show that she had that uh the sister act the movie, yeah. the movie i think it was sister act yeah. one and there was a young lady that was in rebellion and she told that girl she said let me tell you something if you go to bed wanting to sing and you wake up wanting to sing you're a singer <laughs> she says so get ready do what you got to do to be the singer so Whatever burns in your heart to do in a major way, just say, here it is, God, use it for your glory. And there are many things. It's not confined to one. Don't misunderstand me. God can use you a lot. And, uh, you know, my brother sells cars, too. He's got an anointing to sell cars. It's a fact. Somebody we were talking about the other day said, everything they touch turns into gold. It's an anointing for giving. It's all there. That was a real rabbit trail. I hope you're all right. It's, let me know if we're good. Send me some hearts or something. I, I don't know if I overstepped my bounds or overboard anybody, but send me some hearts. Are we good at the tables? Okay. I'm looking for some hearts. Sean, it's good to have you. Uh-oh. Let me give. Okay, there we go. There we go. Got a few hearts. Thank you. I feel better now. All right, we, we rabbit trail big time. So um, I'm going to keep on going, and I know uh, because we have people here, we're just going to go to 11 like normal. If you want to stay with us, you can. If you get tired of being on Facebook, um, it's all right. But I'm glad you're here. So uh, thank you, Christina. There we go. Words of encouragement. We always need those. 
All right. Um, verse 18. Faye, would you finish reading that? Because we didn't read that one. So verse 18. Well, she, she read the rest down there. So we're on, uh, I stopped you at verse, you didn't read 18, so go ahead and read that. That's all right. But we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. Wow, did you hear that? But we all with the open face beholding in a glass the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory even as by the Spirit of God. If we'll allow him, he's changing us into more and more like him. That glory that Moses had that faded, it's not going to fade off of you because he's there to abide forever. Pretty powerful stuff. Okay, we're going to start with chapter 4 and just see where we end up. We'll try to get through chapter 4 and finish. So um, we're in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Miss Maddie, if you don't mind reading, here we go. Therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart. But we have renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word. But by the open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the light of God. Okay, I want to say this. Often the Apostle Paul's ministry was rejected. You know, we, we revere him. We look at him and say, wow, you know, what a great guy. He wrote most of the New Testament. Man, when Paul walked in the room, everybody must have just said, wow, what a great guy. Do you know that tradition says that he... He was a little man. He was beat up. His feet hurt him a lot. They called him a liar, a cheat, a womanizer. And he had to fight for his respect within the church. That's why he had to say, am I not an apostle like everybody else? Did not I pour my life out for you? This is what Paul went through. We think just because someone's anointed that the whole church world accepts them. Listen, if you think it's been hard on you or I think it's been hard on me, the Apostle Paul, a large portion of the church totally rejected him. They didn't give any of the respect that was due him. And he's saying, we, we've stood against all deceit. We, we've, we're doing this thing with complete integrity and character. So it's very powerful. Um, so we're going to go to uh, 3 to 6, Faye Ray, if you would. But even if our gospel is veiled... It is veiled to those who are perishing. Those minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord and ourselves, your bond servants, for Jesus' sake. For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Amen. So here we go. The enemy has a real way, if given a doorway into our life. I want you to hear me. I, I, you are a living epistle, anointed. The Spirit of God dwells inside of each of us, alive, powerful, for the world to read. I just spoke about the anointing that is on areas of our life. And that anointing is so powerful that it is life-changing and transforming. It is that powerful. Now, you take that same anointing and that same glory and then add a blindness to come in. And that's what he's saying. He's saying that to many, they're blinded. And I'm going to say this uh, of the church of Jesus Christ, that the enemy has blinded so many people. And in blinding he literally causes them not to be able to see any longer 
the anointing that is in their life. Can't see any longer the power of God that wants to flow in their lives. There's a blindness that can come to the church today, right now. And I'm not saying um, anything against anyone specific except for this, is that if, if I focus on the bad side of this virus, if I focus on the bad side of our government, if I focus on the conspiracies and all the things that happen within this world I live in, and that becomes my focus, listen to me close, I can easily be blinded by the enemy into accepting things and not seeing what God wants me to see clearly. And I'm going to go right back. The church in Corinth had envy, strife, and division. And because of envy, strife, and division, they were blinded to the truth of God's word. It's so easy. The enemy wants to come in and blind us, church. Ask God, say, God, open my eyes to your truth. Open my eyes to the calling in my life. Open your eyes to my purpose. Let me see that the world is looking to what I have. I said this, uh, I've preached this a thousand times since my brother preached it many years ago. He said, someone is always waiting on the other end of your obedience. Can I change that and say, someone is always affected on the other end of our disobedience? Ouch, I know. Someone is always waiting on the other end of our obedience, and someone is always affected on the other end of our disobedience. Oh, be the light of the world, church. Say, God, show me, remind me again, what is my strong suit? What is my place of anointing, Lord? And let me step back into that place. I've been doing this a long time, guys, a long time. And I don't need, I don't even need, you know, I don't want to sound blasphemous. I don't even need the Holy Spirit to tell me where the anointing is in some people's lives. I don't need it. All I can do is watch. When they do it, everybody knows. Everybody knows. It's just evident to everybody. To everybody. Wow. I can't believe what they do. I'm going to pick at Isabella for a minute again just because she's the only example I've got right now. She writes these little poem things, you know. And she read a story yesterday that she wrote. When she reads these things, it's like, my God, where'd they come? They come straight out of heaven. That is her anointing. It is on those words. And I, you know, I, I'm going to brag for me. I said, the ramp doesn't have any idea what they've got in their hands. Because they've not utilized that gift. They have not seen it. Do you understand? She can never lay that thing down. Because the second she does it, it sends out a... a the presence of God like a wave over anybody that hears it. She read that story yesterday, and I think I saw people writing tears all over the place because it moves the heart. Do you understand? Operate in your anointing. If you're a, a prayer, if you're a prayer meeting person, if you're a preacher, if you're a giver, if you're a baker, if you're whatever you are, let the anointing of God flow in. And I know I've talked about that over and over. Huh? I'm sorry if I'm rambling on. Where are we at? Uh, verse um, seven. 4, verse 7? Mm -hmm. Okay. Maddie, would you mind read verse 7? Here we go. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. Uh-oh. Here we go. But we have this anointing in an earthen vessel that the excellency of the power of God may not be in us. Listen to me. I'm not worthy to do this anymore. Good, you're in the best place. Because the moment I think I'm worthy, the moment I think I can do it, the moment I think I can preach, the moment I think I can prophesy, I took ownership of it, and it's all pride. As long as I know I cannot. God, this vessel can't do any of this. That's called humility and brokenness. So if you say, well, I'm too old, I'm too slow, I'm too this, I'm too that, you're in a great position. I'm too tired. You're in a great position. Because you're not going to take the glory and say, look what I did. You're going to say, God, can you still use me? The answer is yes. The answer is yes. My, my, my. 
We just did a funeral yesterday for a blessed man of God in his 80s, battling uh, dementia, um, health issues, a minister of the gospel. And they gave a testimony that was current. They said they went to uh, a restaurant to eat, the Slidell Denny's. And the mom and the other family members went to the car and the son is paying for the meal and he looks around for his dad who's not the healthiest man in the world and they can't find his dad so you start panicking where's dad he found him you know where he's at he was sitting on a bench beside a man telling him about Jesus Christ even with dementia even with other areas of weakness in his body he's the one we just did his funeral for in his last breath, the anointing is to share the gospel. <laughs> Do you understand? It doesn't matter how tired, weak, sick, or strong, or indifferent we are. It's the mental thing the enemy says, you're too wore out, you're too done, you're too backslid. It's never going to happen again. Those are all lies from hell because the spirit inside of you never got tired. And the spirit inside of me never gets tired. He's ready to do his stuff any given time. That's just good. Thank you, Maddie. Let's go to what Maddie, read verse 8 to 12. We probably won't finish chapter 5. We'll see. Or 4. But read verse 8 to 12, if you would. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not driven to despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. Wow. That kind of goes along with what I just said. He said, we are troubled on every side. Any of you feel that way? Yet we're not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. We're persecuted, but we're not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing in our body about in our body the dying of the Lord, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. He said, we're going through a lot of persecutions and hard times, but it's not going to stop the callings and the anointing in our life. Shoo, my. Lord, help us. Help us, God, to stay right where we need to be. Help us, Lord, to reactivate. The story in the Bible, I think it was Jacob, that as he was on his journey, had to find the old wells of Abraham or Isaac. And he dug the wells up because the enemy had put dirt in the wells to stop them from flowing. Some of us, the enemy has tried to put dirt in our wells. Paul said, I, I'm going through all kinds of stuff. Let me tell you, they said when he came into a room, both of his feet were almost crippled from the beatings that he received. But he said, it doesn't matter. I'm still going to declare under the anointing that I'm called to work in. The glory of God is going to come out of me. <laughs> that brother that passed away, the glory of God was coming out of him. Okay. So then death works in us, but life in you. You know what he's saying? He's saying, so I'll handle the suffering so that you can have life. I was thinking yesterday, I said, Paul said this, I'm ready to die and to go home with Jesus. He said, to be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord. I'm ready to go. But for your sakes, I want to hang around and endure the pain a little bit longer so I can push this gospel message. That's pretty powerful. Pretty powerful. He said, I'm not going to slow down pushing this message. I'm going to go on. He said, I'm distressed in every way. So he said, so the pain I go through is producing life in somebody else. I'll handle the journey. I hope that encourages somebody today. It does me. Okay. Uh, 13 to 15. Fabry, you want to read that? And since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what is written, I believed and therefore I spoke. We also believe and therefore speak, knowing that 
he who raised up the Lord Jesus will also raise up with Jesus and will present us with you. For all things are for your sakes, and that grace, having spread through the many, may cause thanksgiving to abound to the glory of God. Do you understand what he was saying? He's saying, I live my life not just for me, but for others. What's your anointing? It may be on your job. Cindy Adams, good to have you. Brother Joe, good to have you. It may be where your, your workplace is. It may be where you go to school. It may be, you know, there are some people, uh, my sister Rose on here, now she's got some other areas of anointings in her life, but one area that she's always had a powerful anointing is, it was like, and her and I, I think I compared her and Joe Kyle, a solid rock. They would always speak an encouraging word. They're encouragers. Very powerful. Always have that word of encouragement. And there's an anointing in that. And, and those of us that need that word in the right season, it's very powerful. But I told Joe Kiley one time, I said, you always have a word of encouragement. My sister Rose on here, if she's still on, she would do the same thing. We, we, there's something, it's there. And th those giftings are very, very powerful. So let's go on. Uh, 16, 17, 18, we're going to read. Are you with us, Sandra? We are in 2 Corinthians. Um, can you finish reading? You're going to let you read. She, Sandra has joined us a little bit late, but I'm glad to have her. We're going to read uh, 2 Corinthians and end it, verse 16, 17, and 18, chapter 4. Go ahead. Let me read it, because you're way over there. Let me read it for them. For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. Go ahead, keep reading. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us in a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Keep going. Okay, Paul's preaching a message that I preached several times. He said, I don't look to the things that are temporal. He says, my pain for the moment, my light affliction, and he's calling it light affliction. <laughs> What's light about it? They beat him half to death. He was literally calling it light affliction compared to the glory of God. He said, it doesn't matter what I'm going through. I'm looking to the weight of God's glory. I'm looking to the eternal value of things. I'm looking to the purpose and the calling that is there. And if my outward man perishes, I'll drag that joker along until we go to heaven because the inward man, the, the inside man is renewed every single day in the presence of God. Are you hearing me? It's so easy. It's so easy to get discouraged. We, you know, we endure hardships. We endure pain. We endure disasters. We endure death. We endure trauma. And Paul went through all of this, and he says, this is what we might walk through, but be strengthened on the inner man because the glory that God has for you to give is greater than the suffering that is out there today in our lives. And he says, start looking to the eternal things. Start looking to that which is eternal. What, what eternal action can you give right now that will affect the future? I mean, I'm thinking about my mother's life, and I'm sorry if I use my family a lot, but they're like the examples I've got. But I'm watching my mother's life and realizing when that preacher came to her house, Reverend French, I think was his name, and there sat across from him a demon-possessed woman telling fortunes with a Ouija board, and he's sitting across the table some unsaved guy calls him up and says, you've got to come and minister to this lady. She's in trouble. That's a pretty bad way off when the unsaved get a preacher to help you. And he's sitting across the table praying in the Holy Ghost. He doesn't even know what to do with her. 
She's over there quoting scriptures, demons talking through her, and he's over there praying in the Holy Spirit. He had no idea of the level of eternal value that his actions in that single day would produce. No idea. When she's sitting across her with a Ouija board quoting scriptures and talking about how can a woman have a baby when she's a virgin, this is all lies. And he's over there praying in the Holy Spirit. And then this Ouija board starts spelling out, I am evil. Shortly after that, the demons left her. She got delivered. She got set free. She got filled with the Holy Ghost. She began to study the Word of God. She was trained and taught and became a minister and a pastor and raised her kids up to serve the Lord. And the kids, one by one, got saved and filled the Holy Spirit and began to preach the gospel of Christ. I'm going to tell you something. That preacher, when he stands in heaven, will never see until that day comes the fullness of the value of that one simple act under his anointing. He didn't know what to do, but he prayed in the Holy Spirit across from a demon-possessed lady. He didn't know that she would get saved, her husband would get saved, her kids would get saved. Most of them would become ministers of the gospel, that hundreds of thousands of people would be touched because of that single act. Oh, how great our God is. Do you understand your importance, our importance, we can look and say, man, I feel like I'm suffering, I'm wore out, I'm beat up, I'm this, I'm that. Huh. You just do what you're called to do. Because when you leave this earth, one day you'll look around behind you and say, wow, I did all that? You may never know on earth, but you will know on planet heaven. <laughs> when God says, see all them, that's a product of your obedience. Oh, my God. Can I really break your heart for a minute? What if you stand there and he says, see all them? That's a third of what should have been from your obedience. The two-thirds didn't make it because of your disobedience. Ouch. I'm ending on a sour note, aren't I? I'm so sorry. But it's the truth. I'll just say, God, here I am. Ask him right now, Lord. Show me the areas of my anointing. And if you don't know what it is, just ask somebody around you. Say, tell me what I'm strong in. Because that's a place. We're going to do a lot of things. Don't misunderstand me. We're going to do a lot of things in life, in obedience, in education. We're going to do a lot of things. And they're all good. God will use them all. But there are certain areas of our life that have a level of anointing that's specifically given as a gift from God in those areas. Hmm. I don't want to stand before God and say, David, if you were a little more obedient, there'd have been a lot more than this. Now, I know we've all messed up, trust me, even me. <laughs> I'm no saint. There's no Saint David here. We've messed up. We've made some some blunders but it's not too late to say God here I am they go the last mile of the way on the rest of my journey Father God I'm asking you to use me for the kingdom's glory use me I give you my hands my mouth all that I am God here I am is my call to get on the phone is my call to bake a cake is my call to serve somebody is my call to be served. I'll throw that one out for a minute. That's a hard one. It's a real hard one for people to serve you. But you know something? When you serve or being served, you're giving room for someone to bless and someone to be used. If you're the one getting served by somebody, listen to me. After they serve you, say, hold on a minute, come here. I want to put some anointing on you. And you lay your hand on them. Well, I don't know if I can do that. Yeah, probably right. Because you haven't read the Bible. Because I read in the Bible a lot of men laid their hands on other people and the anointing came on them. Do you understand? 
no matter what capacity we are in in this life, the anointing is on you to bless somebody. To bless somebody. I think it was Wigglesworth or Finney or one of those guys. Um, I can't remember which one. Lester Summerall, I think, went and said, in their last days, so would you lay your hands on me and bless me, while they were serving the elder man on his deathbed, the elder man was able to bless. I'm just saying, you got more going for you than you realize. You are somebody. Whew. So thank you for joining us today. We did make it almost an hour and a half, and most of you hung with us. I hope we didn't bore you, and uh, thank you. Uh, say hi to Sandra and Fay Ray and Miss Maddie. You joined us today, and um, I'm glad you came. So remember Youth Tonight at 7 o'clock. It's going to be live, very powerful. And then remember, um, tomorrow at noon is another daily word, and then tomorrow night at 7 is live service. You're allowed to come. You're allowed to come on Facebook Live and watch it. We love you. God bless each of you. Next week we'll be on Chapter... Five? We're yeah. close, I think. Yeah, so. All right. God bless you guys.